I'll um I'll get to this later. But in the meantime, I'd like to give a big congratulations to Marvel. You finally created a TV show I enjoy watching. All 13 episodes of the new Daredevil series dropped on Friday, and I absolutely loved it. The story is very gripping and it keeps you wanting to come back for more. It's gritty and realistic in terms of the violence, and that realism really makes you feel everything that Daredevil feels. No physically and emotionally. It's a very cool introduction to Daredevil and the world he lives in, and it's great for people who are new to Daredevil like me. But what I think really makes this show come to life is the characters. Let's start with the main players, Matt Murdock, aka Daredevil, and Wilson Fisk, aka Kingpin. Matt is blind, but due to some radioactive stuff that he got in his eyes, all his other senses are heightened way beyond normal human capacity. So what does he do with these powers that he's gotten? Well, he roams the street at night beating up bad guys. Good for him. In the daytime, he also works as a lawyer with his best friend Foggy Nelson. They are determined to be a moral lawyer firm who will always help the innocent through the law. Wilson Fisk works very well as an antagonist for the series. In the first few episodes, we don't actually see him, we only hear him mentioned or alluded to. And that works very well because it reflects the way that the character lives, staying back in the shadows, manipulating people from the darkness. He is a believable, compelling, at times sympathetic villain, all of which are really good things. And while he does generally tend to send um, henchmen or employees to do his work for him, he's not afraid to get his own hands dirty should the need arise for it. Seeing Fisk come to blows with Daredevil is very gripping and entertaining to watch. And finally, I think one of the best things about this show is the supporting cast. When I first saw Foggy's character come onto the screen, I was like, okay, here's the stereotypical goofball friend. But then when things really started to kick off, I was like, okay, wow. There are actually some real emotional depths to this character. In fact, there's emotional depths to all of them. The sporting cast of this light up the screen, they're all really interesting, well-developed, brilliantly acted characters who you want to know more about and you want to be on side for, even the villains. The highlight episodes for me were episode 5, episode 10 and episode 13, and I'm really looking forward to season 2 because there were a few hints in the first series of things to come and I just really want to see more of Daredevil. Keeping things Marvel for now, so lots of people saw the first Ant-Man trailer and they got really worried for the film. They didn't think it was going to be any good. Remind me what I said. And of course, the Ant-Man trailer came out and it looks incredible. That's right, I had faith in Ant-Man from the start. So bear that in mind, all you people who are only now jumping on the ant wagon. Seriously, this film looks amazing. It's Paul Rudd shrinking down to miniature size, controlling ants, and beating people up. Who doesn't want to see that? The humour in this trailer is perfect as well. This trailer made me laugh out loud at the jokes that are in it. MCU films in general have a comedic vibe going, and when you throw Paul Rudd in the mix, you know it's going to be a good time. Plus, the supporting cast are all very welcome additions to the MCU. I really like the look of Yellowjacket, who will be the film's primary antagonist. Yeah. Bet no one's made that joke before. Especially that bit in the trailer where they're fighting on a toy train track. That moment filled me with something that can only be described as delight. That man is so high on my list of anticipated movies right now, I cannot wait till it comes out. Speaking of second trailers, Terminator Genesis. Oh boy. The second trailer for Terminator Genesis has come out, and lots of people have been complaining that it gives too much of the plot away. And it does. I'm not going to say what the spoilers are, but what I am going to say is... What? That's the only thing I can think after watching this trailer. Just, what? What is happening? I just... Th th there are no words. There are no words to describe how ridiculous the story of this film looks. And we still don't know what Matt Smith is up to in this movie, although at this point it would not surprise me if he was actually playing Doctor Who, and they did a crossover involving him having his time travel technology stolen by the Terminators and setting the whole thing off. At this point, I would not be surprised if that happened. With, with the first trailer I was actually thinking, okay, I'll give it the benefit of the doubt and I go and see it. With this trailer, no. No, I don't think I'm going to go see this film anymore. It's really quite a downer. Gonna have to go and watch the Ant-Man trailer again. Okay, now we come to this. Uh, yes, it's a Night's Watch cloak. I got it for Halloween last year. And I've been looking for an excuse to wear it again. And that excuse has come in the form of Game of Thrones Season 5. 
That's right, the series has now started, which means I'm going to have even more to say about Game of Thrones than I usually do. I'm going to be honest, there was nothing particularly outstanding about the first episode. I mean, it was fine, there was just nothing outstanding. Don't get me wrong, it was a great episode, enjoyable to watch. It's what you expect from Game of Thrones, you know? It was a good episode to get you settled back into it, to catch up with all the characters and show you where it might be going. The opening of the episode was the series' first flashback, which showed a young Cersei and her friend visiting a witch in the woods named Maggie the Frog. Maggie then predicts Cersei's future, saying that she will be queen for a time until someone younger and more beautiful takes her place. She also tells Cersei she will have three children. Gold will be their crowns and gold will be their shrouds. Implying that Tom and Anne Marcella might not be as safe as she would like. Especially Marcella, considering she's in Dawn and, you know, with what happened to Oberyn and all that. Interestingly, there was a part of the prophecy in the books that they left out in the show about something called a Valonqar, which really drives Cersei's paranoia in the books. There might be a specific reason why they left that out, or maybe they just didn't want to do it, but the Valonqar is High Valyrian, and it means the little brother. Which is more open for interpretation than you'd think at first. The whole prophecy is really open for interpretation, as is any prophecy in Game of Thrones. But enough about Cersei being a paranoid lunatic. Let's talk about the final sequence. The final sequence takes us back to the war with Jon Snow, Stannis, Davos and Melisandre, and a Mance Raider, the king beyond the wall. That didn't go so well for him, did it? So the thing is, it's difficult to talk about this particular scene without spoiling it. So I'm going to put the spoiler warning here, and you can skip to my John Wick review in the description below. So Stannis wants to burn Mance Raider to death, unless Mance gets the Wildlings to join Stannis' cause. Mance refuses, and Stannis has him burnt to death on a pirate the wall. In the closing moments you can see the pain, the anguish and the fear that's in Mance Raider as he's burning to death, and then thwack! He's put out of his misery by an arrow, fired by Jon Snow. Good on you, Jon. Ending the man's suffering. It's an important moment because Jon's character is developing nicely into someone who you could potentially see as a leader. And considering there is an imminent election for the 998th Lord Commander of the Wall, since Lord Commander Mormont got stabbed through the mouth, all in all, really good episode, I really liked it, it just didn't have anything particularly stand out, apart from maybe Mance's death scene. So, Theon Greyjoy has done some pretty bad things in his time, I can think of a few, but killing Neo's dog, that is by far the worst. That is the basic plotline for John Wick, a film that has only just recently come out in the UK, despite coming out in October in America, don't ask me why. Keanu Reeves plays the titular character, a man who used to be an assassin but left to pursue a romantic life and got married. Oh. But then his wife died, which is sad, but she got him a dog, which is happy. So I'm pretty sure this dog is the only moral centre in the movie. <laughs> then in comes Alfie Allen's character. He comes into a petrol station driving a car with terrible music blasting from it, earning him the villain ranking of instantly unlikable, no redemption. So. Alfie Allen's character, Yosef, kills John Wick's dog. Naturally, John Wick then goes on a brutal revenge killing spree. Because, what, what would you do? And if you haven't guessed already, this film is a very violent action thriller. So if you're not into those, it probably isn't the film for you. It's very fast paced, and the action is almost non stop. Then it worked. There are several scenes full of black humour because John Wick is a very famous, well known assassin, and he's got connections with all these. Important figures up, and they're just nonchalantly okay with everything that's going down. Which is quite funny in a dark way. You can certainly empathise with the character of John Wick, and he's a guy you can root for. And this movie is a good time, though it's not without flaw. There were a lot of films that felt slightly off about this movie. The narrative jumps around quite a lot, and it goes from being an interesting way to tell a story to just being plain annoying. When there are two scenes that take place chronologically right next to each other, you don't need to intercut them. The dialogue was fine for the most part, though the swear words felt very injected and forced in there. It seemed like 
the characters were just swearing for the sake of having a film full of swear words, rather than that being anything to do with character development. Speaking of character development, there wasn't a great deal of that. First of all, everyone in this movie is essentially a villain. Some are just more villainous than others. Some characters are underused, some characters are overused, some don't need to be there at all. In addition, and this isn't a flaw per se, it's just slightly strange, when uh, the Russians are speaking and the subtitles come up, some of the words, seemingly random, are just bold and colourful for no apparent reason. But even with all of that that I just said, it is still a very enjoyable movie. It has moments that are reminiscent of Die Hard and the first Kick-Ass movie. I'll say this movie could have been better, but even so, it's a good time, it's a fun movie, and it does kick ass. So thank you for watching this episode of Big Screen Small Talk. If you liked it, like it. If you want to see more, subscribe. And if you've got an opinion on my opinions, or just the things I've been talking about, leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Thank you.